The virus that we're talking about having to do, you know, a lot of people think that goes away in April with the heat, as the heat comes in. Uh, typically, that will go away in April. I've spoken to uh, President Xi. They're getting it more and more under control. So uh, I think that's a problem that's going to go away. But when you have 15 people, and the 15 within a couple of days is going to be down to close to zero, uh, that's a pretty good job we've done. It's going to disappear. One day, it's like a miracle. It will disappear. Yes. And from our shores, we've, you know, it could get worse before it gets better. It could maybe go away. We'll see what happens. You have to be calm. It'll go away. It will go away. Just stay calm. It will go away. We need a little separation until such time as this goes away. It's going to go away. It's going to go away. It will go away. You know it. You know it is going away. The number of new infections has risen to nearly 70,000 per day, the highest rate since late July. We're in a really dangerous point, and unfortunately, we're here partly because of our own making. Nationwide, millions of Americans are suffering from pandemic fatigue, tired of masks, social distancing, homeschooling, and working from home. Tonight, an all-out battle against a surging virus. Teams of Air Force nurses deployed to overwhelmed hospitals in North Dakota. In El Paso, the National Guard helping out in morgues running out of space. The chances are that you will see a surge superimposed upon a surge. You, you've heard the projections. The projections are that if nothing fundamentally changes between now and uh, beginning of February, we're, up, we're likely to lose up to four hundred total of 400,000 lives, another 150,000 lives. And uh, so it's real. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Backstory. Reporting from London, I'm Dana Lewis. As I speak to you at the end of November 2020, according to John Hopkins University of Medicine worldwide, 60,465,000 people have caught coronavirus. More than 1,422,000 people have died. Economies around the world have been shut down. Hospitals overwhelmed. So many families have lost loved ones. Now you would think by now we know exactly where this started. How did it begin? Was it a bat in a market in Wuhan, China? You may be surprised to know that is unlikely now. The market part. Was it a laboratory? Maybe. Was it because scientists were experimenting with the virus? Something called gain of function. Many people think so. Did the Chinese know about this before December 31st, 2019, when the World Health Organization reported it? No doubt. Was the first death reported by China really on January 11th? No. You are about to hear an incredibly enlightening interview with two experts, one of them who knows about militarized biological programs, past and future threats, and lessons we better learn from this and another, a virus hunter of sorts, an expert on pandemic outbreaks. The interviews left me with more questions than answers, and I'm sure that will be the same for you. But sometimes that's where you need to go to begin to understand and cut through some of the misinformation. What are the origins of COVID-19 on this backstory? All right, I want to introduce you, first of all, to Andy Weber, who is in uh, in Washington. He's a former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Chemical, Biological, and Nuclear Defense Programs, and he is now at the Center for Strategic Risks. Hi, Andy. Welcome. Hi, Dana. Thank you. And Dr. Daniel Lucy, also in Washington, is a senior scholar with the O'Neill Institute uh, for National and Global Health Law. He is also an adjunct professor of medicine and infectious diseases at Georgetown, uh, and an expert on outbreaks and pandemics. Daniel, thanks for doing this. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Dan. So, I mean, we have some good news today, just to start off with uh, here in the UK, while I speak to you from London, that we have another vaccine uh, but, you know, that was developed with Oxford University in addition to Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, are we about to come out of this dark tunnel? Daniel, can I start with you? I hope so. I hope so. But it's a long trip until we reach the uh, end of the tunnel. For our countries, the UK, the US, but certainly a longer tunnel for much of the developing world. Andy? 
Yeah, I agree. Well, first of all, here in the U.S., I mean, we're at peak rates. Deaths are have never been higher. Uh, so it, it's it's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. We need to redouble our efforts to use proven methods like wearing masks and closing bars and and uh, you know staying six feet apart because we know that works and we need to bend the curve down here. But having a vaccine available for the first for the healthcare workers, the first line defenders against this pandemic will be amazing. And I'm told that that could be as early as uh, as uh, December. Dr. Um, Lucy, I was I was watching an interview that you did in January uh, when this all started. And you <laughs> said you, we, we should be concerned, but not overly frightened. Should we, in fact, have been quite frightened because we're now at one point four million deaths and climbing? I think we should always be frightened. Every outbreak I've gone to, uh, I'm very frightened myself. Uh, when I worked with many patients with Ebola in uh, 2014 in Syria and Liberia, often when I did interviews, they said, aren't you afraid? I said, of course I'm afraid. If I'm not afraid, I shouldn't be here. So I'd say uh, uh, of all those interviews in January, that if I said uh, we shouldn't be overly frightened, I, I agree. Uh, you, shouldn't, you should never be overly frightened because that paralyzes you. That's paralytic fear. We need catalytic fear. So yes, you should always be frightened um, but yes, we should have been more, more catalytic fear. We should have taken many more actions in January than, than we did. What do we know now? I mean, we, we know that one of the first patients um, has been traced back to November the 17th, 2019. So we are almost year on, you know, a year into this. Do we know where COVID-19 began and do we know how it began? Andy, do you want to take a first run at that? Sure. I mean, the, the sad news is, no, we don't know the answer to that. And that is a critical question. Um, I'm not convinced the Chinese know the answer to that, but they have not been very cooperative in, in working with the international community to get to that answer. Um, you know, there are different theories of, of how it started, but uh, we should be able to determine the origin of this virus if we're going to be successful in preventing the next one. Daniel, why are the Chinese not being cooperative? I mean, why have they not come clean? What are they, are they hiding something? So this is very controversial. I pursued it from the very beginning uh, uh, in terms of origin since uh, the night of December the 30th, uh, when I first saw the report uh, from the ophthalmology physician who uh, was one of the first eight whistleblowers, uh, Dr. Dr. Li, who died on February the 6th, February the 7th in China. Um, so first I would say uh, that um, I think to some extent the Chinese have been cooperative. So that's not uh, the mainstream uh, view here in the, in the United States, but I think that uh, particularly their uh, healthcare providers uh, have been and were early in January uh, cooperative in terms of trying to get the truth out to the world as best they could, including those first eight healthcare workers, including Dr. Lee who, who died um, and uh, who was brought in the police office in December. Uh, after he said, well, there seems to be a contagious SARS-like pneumonia. Uh, but there are a number of very, very important uh, uh, publications, actually quite a few, from the mainland and from Hong Kong uh, early on uh, about what was going on uh, in terms of the earliest cases. Uh, and I've mentioned two in particular, January 24th, a Friday in the Lancet, uh, based obviously in the UK, uh, as you know, and then uh, the New England Journal of Medicine the following Wednesday, January the 29th. Those are the points of departure that I mentioned, but there are other publications as well subsequently, including by the China CDC in Beijing in the China CDC Weekly publication, which is like the US CDC uh, Morbidity and Mort Mortality Weekly Report. So why, why is that working. relevant? Sorry. Yeah, it's relevant because uh, there's specific uh, data that's presented in all of those references that I just mentioned, mentioned as well as quite a few others uh, that I've tracked and written about repeatedly on the Infectious Disease Society of America Science Speaks website about initial cases and the um, search for the origins, search meaning in humans, in animals, and in the environment. So I think there is objective uh, data. And most uh, recently, and I think most importantly, uh, is the uh, publication on the WHO website this month, mm -hmm. uh, the first week of this month, around the 5th or 6th of November, of what's called the Terms of Reference for the WHO China joint mission, the second one, to go uh, to search for the origins uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the virus. And it's, now the date 
here on this document is 31 July, 2020. It only came out this month because the terms of reference for this investigation had to be agreed upon by China uh, as well as WHO. And where, where does that lead us? I mean, yeah. there was a delay in terms of reference because the Chinese didn't want to go somewhere with it. They certainly didn't say that in the document, but uh, uh, to my view, um, they provide information here in this document, it's nine pages on page five in particular, that hasn't appeared anywhere else before. And it's, uh, in, in my view, uh, an important incremental addition of objective data, at least according to China, um, that, that we haven't had before. Uh, so I created a timeline of what we've learned and when we've learned it, uh, going back to, to, to end of December, early January. But this document says, for example, what I think is important, um, most important, uh, is that there were 124 laboratory confirmed human cases of SARS coronavirus 2 causing COVID-19 in the month of December. And of those 124, 119 were in Wuhan, but five were not in Wuhan. They say they were in Hubei province, you know, where Wuhan's the capital, and, and, and elsewhere, but they don't say where elsewhere. So the important point is 124 cases, that's many more in December than we ever uh, heard about from China previously. In January, they said- in the last debate, they go, It doesn't, if ahead. I could just jump in, it doesn't seem like a lot of cases to me as a layman, uh, considering how many cases we have now, but you obviously feel that that was a significant number that should have been reported worldwide immediately. Or uh, I'd emphasize that it was December, December that the, there were these 124 laboratory cases, confirmed cases in Hubei province, mostly in Wuhan. What they don't say is how many were there in November, because as you mentioned, it's been reported by Josephine Ma, her byline in the South China Morning Post in mid-March, that she saw an unpublished government uh, report of an investigation of the outbreak that said that the earliest known case, probably not the first, but the earliest known was November 17th, and that there was one to five cases every day after that in November, and then quite a few more in December. So <clears throat> I think that, in fact, the origins go back quite some time, many months, perhaps more than a year. Um, and the reason I say that um, is because the first we heard of this virus, and everyone agrees on this, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, it was already fully adapted to our species, to humans, to be able to be transmitted from person to person uh, through the air and perhaps other ways, but through the air very, very efficiently. And that to me means it was impossible if it was naturally occurring to have begun in December in that seafood market in Wuhan. Daniel. Not possible. All right, Daniel, let, let me just bring in Andy here. And Andy, thanks for being patient. That, that certainly leads us down, you know, as a reporter, that, that just tells me that the Chinese government was covering up um, and raises uh, in in huge uh, capital letters that the Wuhan market probably wasn't the source. Where do you line up on it, Andy? Yeah, I, I, I don't think we have uh, any uh, any proof that the Wuhan market was the source of uh, the original source of this virus. Um, a lot of the evidence and, and samples that were taken at the market apparently have been destroyed. What Dr. Lucy says is, is very important. Um, indeed, if this started months before December um, in humans, and 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 how did how did it accelerate so quickly and spread so efficiently? Um, you know, these are important questions. Now, we do know that, for example, local officials in, uh, in Wuhan were not forthcoming with the central government in Beijing initially. Uh, they sort of had a knee-jerk reaction of trying to cover up the outbreak and its uh, severity. Um, that's unfortunate. But it will take a lot of scientific effort, and I'd be interested uh, where Dr. Lucy is today on the, on the you know, theor theoretical origin of, of this particular outbreak. Uh, what does he think was the original source? You can ask him. Dan? So I'll try to stay more succinct, sorry, Dan and, and Andy, but um, first let me just say, I disagree a little bit with Andy uh, on, on the one hand that, 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 that the local officials uh, covered up events uh, and then the Beijing officials didn't know them. I think Beijing knew everything from the beginning, from December. 
And I think there's a paper trail that can that can support that. I realize that other distinguished people, uh, as, as well as Andy uh, and others, feel feel otherwise that there was a cover up. But for me, there, there wasn't. Uh, but as far as the question Andy uh, asked, well, first also I agree with Andy 100%. But this seafood market, it was never the source of the epidemic, and, and I and I wrote that on Saturday, January the 25th, on the Infectious Disease Society of America website. It was picked up by Science Magazine. John Cohen he sent it out Sunday night, January the 26th, the ninth day around the world, um, that the market was probably not the source. And subsequently, on May 23rd, one day after the beginning of the very important two sessions annual two sessions in China, in Beijing this year, uh, delayed because of COVID. Uh, uh, Director General of the China CDC in Beijing, George Fu Gao, Gao Fu, said the market was not the source, it was just another victim. So let me stop there and then try to answer Andy's question. Uh, wh wh what was, the, wh what was the, the source of the epidemic? I think clearly, I, I don't know, we don't know. I have strong opinions and I'm still trying to gather data I, all I, the time. I feel I, I, and I don't want to cut you up because your, your, your answer is so important, but I can see you're, you're not coming straight out and saying what you say, the, the main, like a detective, uh, you know, on the murder case, you're not saying who the main suspect is. But I think, can we just come to it? It seems to be that there is growing consensus and has been for some time that it was the Wuhan laboratory. Do you agree with that? And that they may have been uh, doing something called gain of function. Will you, will you address that, both of you? Andy, do you want to go first? Or? No, go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah. just, just, just nudge me off the cliff. Okay. So first of all, I, I, I don't agree, Dana, that, uh, the, uh, that the evidence is uh, going towards uh, that uh, the source was the uh, Wuhan uh, uh, laboratory, either the Institute of Virology uh, uh, headed by uh, Sheng Li Shi, or by the by the the local CDC lab, uh, which was close to the market, closer than the Wuhan Institute. I don't think so. There's been a lot of uh, talk about that, and uh, certainly very high-ranking people in the U.S. government uh, have have said that there's quote enormous evidence end quote that that was the case, but they haven't presented it. I haven't seen it. I don't believe it. I what don't believe it? that's the source. What, what do you think it was? So I think it was a naturally occurring uh, a, a pandemic, a naturally occurring. Uh, uh, outbreak, which then became the epidemic, the pan epidemic, and now the, the devastating economic and public health uh, uh, pandemic, uh, the worst in uh, you know 100, 101 years, 102 years. So I think it was naturally occurring, and that's why I think it began many months earlier than December, because it takes many months for a virus to fully adapt to our species, and a virus that presumably comes from an animal or more than one animal species, to infect our species, humans, and become highly contagious through the air. That sounds very innocent then on your part. Andy, do, do, you, do you also discount the Wuhan lab and gain of function experiments? No, I don't. And, and, and Dr. Lucy has studied this deeply and, and I'm very interested in, in his view on this. But um, in 2016, a uh, scientist from the Wuhan Institute of Virology um, published uh, work they had done the prior year on so-called gain of function experiments. Can, we, uh, they, Andy, can you explain gain of function while you talk about it? Because most people uh, don't know what they are. On, on coronavirus. It's essentially um, working in the laboratory, um, often with animals, to try to uh, evolve the virus so it transmits more easily between animals in order to, in theory, to be able to prevent a spillover event from animals to humans. Personally think that the risks of doing this type of research um, far outweigh any uh, potential benefit. What makes you think it was gain of function before I, I, I go back over to Dr. Lucy? Well, it's one of those uh, data points that we don't have. I mean, were they continuing to do this type of gain of function work beyond uh, 2015, I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's one of the questions that uh, is fairly easy to answer, as well as you know, what type of animals were they using in the laboratory, et cetera. But I also don't quite understand what, what exactly is meant by it naturally occurring. Um, you know, I'm not saying that this was a genetically engineered bioweapon. I think that has been totally discounted. 
but they could use natural methods of evolving it from generation to generation in animals, uh, doing what they would consider legitimate public health research. I mean, the, the, the U.S. National Institutes of Health that Tony Fauci runs is currently funding gain-of-function research in the Netherlands and elsewhere. That's on, on the flu virus. The risk of, of creating a, a super flu and then having it escape from a laboratory, either through a worker getting infected and taking it home um, or a release into the environment, I think far outweighs the uh, medical benefit of conducting this type of research. It was, it was banned in the U.S. in, t- in 2014, and then it was... Well, there was a there was a moratorium on this type of research yeah. um, after the uh, the Dutch scientist was attempting to publish a paper purporting to have made uh, the highly pathogenic avian influenza virus uh, more easily transmissible uh, in an experiment with ferrets, um, but that moratorium was was lifted. Um, I believe in 2017. So such research continues to be funded by the United States government. And I, I just think it's an unjustifiable uh, risk. Dr. Lucy, could you answer Andy's question as to, you know, he's not sure what you meant by natural. Um, and why, why do you think it wasn't gain of function, potentially? Mm-hmm. But by natural, I mean the same as for SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome from you know, China, Guangdong province in the southeast, where the first case was thought to be November the 16th, 2002, then into 2003, as we know, or the Middle East respiratory syndrome, coronavirus pneumonia, that uh, was first uh, found retrospectively in a, in a hospital in uh, Zarqa, Jordan in uh, April of 2012, and then subsequently mostly in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so most viruses, uh, Nipah virus, uh, uh, Ebola, they're, they're naturally occurring. They come from uh, animal species to human species for the, for the most part. Um, what Andy mentioned about the uh, experience with a bird flu called H5N1, uh, that, that's different. To me. Uh, it was originally called dual use research of concern, but uh, uh, basically a uh, gain of function. It means the, the virus H5N1 in this case gain the function of being able to spread through the air from ferret to ferret, which are mammals. So uh, by implication, it could spread through the air between humans. But I'd like to emphasize that uh, the United States has done a lot of documented public information, publicly available information, uh, 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 gain of function like research as well. Uh, we've, I think, probably just made more made it public uh, more so than other countries. But I'd say very importantly, it wasn't only the Dutch at Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, but it was the Americans, the Dr. Kawoka's lab in the United States, that also did in parallel at the same time and published at the same time in premier journals, Science and Nature, uh, in 2012, this um, basically gain of function research for H5N1 being able to be spread from ferret to ferret in the laboratory. We, we did it, the Dutch did it. it. They were both funded by the US uh, NIH, Dr. Fauci's Institute, the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease. Uh, let me just stop there. All right, so I appreciate both of you have limited time here, so I just want to, try to come to where we are now. And that is, Andy, look, you have a tremendous background, more than people understand, in terms of uh, trying to stop biological weapons, along with chemical, along with nuclear attacks. You've just recently written a uh, editorial along with Christine Parthamore in the LA Times, where you said biological attacks are now more appealing than ever that the lesson coming out of this, which I would have thought would be, you know, biological experimentation, gain of function, probably is lost on rogue governments and terrorist organizations, which may now see biological weapons uh, as something that that they could introduce, uh, understanding uh, how they've crippled economies and, and killed tens of thousands of people. You have a real concern, whatever the final uh, trail is on how this virus started, uh, that it puts us in a much more dangerous place. Oh, absolutely. And in our uh, LA Times piece, we spell this out, but basically our adversaries can watch uh, the fumbling response that the United States has had to this biological event. And and imagine if it had been a, uh, a bioengineered weapon 
uh, with 30% mortality instead of 2 to 3% mortality. It could be much, much worse than what we're experiencing now, but our response has been so fumbling, I'm concerned that we send the message of, of uh, vulnerability and that those who would wish to do us harm will see that as an opportunity to pursue the deliberate use of, of biological weapons against us. So that's the, uh, that's the chilling effect. But on the positive side, uh, our response, especially the scientific and medical response, has accelerated modern, uh, really um, game-changing technologies for early warning and detection and uh, medical countermeasures, therapeutics, vaccines, that are now being proven for the first time in humans that will make us much better prepared to prevent or nip in the bud the next potential pandemic. Will the Biden administration, um, do you think, and I know you have some input there, will they overhaul uh, and dramatically change the America's ability to have enhanced preparedness as you, as you termed it in that editorial? Oh, absolutely. That's something that we at the Council on Strategic Risks are advising um, that the next administration, the Biden administration, uh, increase the, the resourcing and level of effort and public-private partnerships to really create a system of robust pandemic prevention, early warning, and rapid countermeasures so we can make this the last pandemic and in the process significantly reduce the threat of, of biological weapons specifically. Dr. Lucy, thanks for being patient there. My, the last word to you, sir. What I'd like to say is very sobering, uh, which is that since March of this year, uh, after I'd uh, gone to, 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 to Shanghai, to Hong Kong, to Cairo for COVID-19, I began to have the sense that something else is coming or something else is already here. And that's what I've been looking for ever since that time. I hope I'm wrong. But I think that is the operational day-to-day -day, uh, leaning forward focus that, that, that I take and I hope uh, uh, others take. In other words, what's next is already here, but we just haven't recognized it yet. And that's my driving philosophy after many years of going to many epidemics every year overseas since 2003. Uh, and it's, it's, the, it's what's on the wall, the final section of the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History here in DC. There's a large uh, exhibit on epidemics, viral epidemics that come from animals. I proposed it in 2014 and I worked on it and it opened 2018 till 2022. Now we're going to add a section on COVID. Uh, it's it's what I believe with my heart, heart and soul and it's, it's how I'm going to pursue the rest of my career. I really think that something is out there. We need to find it and act much better than we did with regard to SARS coronavirus 2 to stop it from becoming a pandemic. It's already out there. You don't have evidence that something is out there, but you the, the the reasonable expectation is it's just a matter of time till the next one comes along. Uh, yes, if I had evidence, I would I would share it with Andy and you and everybody else. But I've actually physically gone to places looking for it uh, in the past couple of months, uh, as well as you know internet through friends around the world, etc. I haven't found it. I hope it doesn't exist, but I believe that it does, and Another I believe virus. that's the attitude we should have. Another virus. Oh, it could be a virus, it could be a bacteria, it could be a prion, it could be some, some other pathogen. But yes, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of infectious diseases. And have you seen evidence of an infectious disease after COVID-19, another one? Well, they're, they're occurring all around the world. There is one particular one that I went to search for. I didn't find it, but the week after I left, it was found. But it was not, it was a very small number of people. It wasn't an outbreak. So as long as it doesn't cause an outbreak, fine. Um, but if anything, it just reinforced my sense of this is what we should be doing, or at least what I should be doing, actively looking, including going on the ground. Thank you for explaining that to Dr. Daniel Lucy from Georgetown and uh, Andy Weber, the former Assistant Secretary for Defense for Chemical, Biological and, Biological and Nuclear Defense Programs. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. World Health Organization officials say an international team of scientists will be traveling again to China in due time to continue an investigation into the origins of the coronavirus 
that causes COVID-19. A team was there over the summer discussing which studies had to take place with the Chinese government. The WHO officials said they look forward to making progress on the investigation, not only into animal origins of the virus, but also into how the virus can jump from species to species. The real question is, quote, the origin species barrier. Where did that occur? And that is still unknown, said an official. I would suggest we read between the lines. An investigation that's happening very slowly, very late. And one wonders if the Chinese government will allow investigators to really uncover everything about how this virus appeared and where. I'm Dana Lewis. Thanks for listening to Backstory. Please subscribe and share this podcast. And if you'd like to be a sponsor, drop us a line. I'll talk to you again soon.